Uh, hello all, welcome to the webinar series of IEEE Joint MTT APMC CAS uh, Joint Chapter Samabad. I am Dr. Nochran Shweb. I am the uh, chair of this chapter and also serving as associate professor at Research Institute for Microwave and Millimeter Wave Studies, DREAMS, at National University of Science and Technology, Islamabad, uh, Pakistan. Uh, we are located in Islamabad. So Islamabad is the capital of Pakistan. It has the natural beauty also is a business hub and it is a place where we will conduct our first uh, RFI Micro Conference of Pakistan, first of its kind, uh, titled as First IEEE International Conference on Microwave Antennas and Circuits, ICMAC. And I hope uh, that uh, uh, you people will join us in Islamabad and deliver your presentations. So National University of Science and Technology has several campuses and it's one of campus is in Islamabad. And this is a bird's eye view of uh, a very well-managed campus. And we are here uh, in this building. So this building is known as DREAMS, also known as the Research Institute for Microwave and Millimeter Studies. Uh, DREAMS is a specialized postgraduate institute that offer master and PhD degrees in RF and microwave. Um, we also have the state-of-the-art uh, measurement facilities, including an echo chamber that works up to 40 gigahertz. We have electromagnetic compatibility interference lab that uh, is used for uh, electromagnetic compatibility measurements and for consultancy services. We have micro research and antenna lab, as well as PCB fabrication lab under one roof. The idea of have all these facilities under one roof is to provide an opportunity to students that learn, not just learn from the theoretical knowledge, but also gain hands-on experience from all these facilities that will help them in their future career. So uh, we started and they took the initiative of this webinar series in uh, almost a an year ago, and this is our 29th webinar, and we're very pleased to uh, invite Professor Belenis uh, here, and he's a very well-known professor in, in the RF and micro domain. Uh, a few words of prof about Professor Belenis. Professor Belenis received a BSW degree from Virginia Tech, VA 1964, and MW degree from University of Virginia, VA 1966. He also received the PhD degree in electrical engineering from Ohio State University, Columbus in 1969. He received in 2004 an honorary doctorate degree from Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki, Greece. In addition, he received several prestigious awards, including 2021, the IEEE Electromagnetic Technical Field Award, 2017 IEEE Rudolf E. Hanning Distinguished Mentoring Award, 2014 James R. Rudolph Lifetime Achievement Award, 2012 Distinguished Achievement Award of IEEE APS Society, Distinguished Achievement Anonymous Award in 2012. In 2005, he received the Chen uh, Tai Distinguished Educator Award of IEEE APS Society. 2000, in 2000, IEEE Minimum Award, 1996 Graduate Mentor um, Award of Arizona State University, 1992 uh, Special Professionalism Award of IEEE Phoenix Section, 1989 Individual Achievement Award of IEEE Region 6, 1987 to 1988 Graduate Teaching Excellence Award from, from School of Engineering, Arizona State University. Dr. Belenis is a Life Fellow of IEEE. He is an author of, of Antenna Theory, Analysis and Design, Advanced Engineering Electromagnetics, and Into Two Smart Antennas uh, book. He is also a editor of Modern Antenna Handbook. And this is a book that we basically follow Antenna Theory, Analysis and Design in Pakistan very regularly in various universities. Uh, that is written by Professor Belenis, and it's really a prestigious uh, moment for us as well. A real clear to invite Professor Belenis uh, today in our webinar series. The title of his talk is The Evolution of Antenna Theory Past, Present, and Future. So, without any further delay, I request Professor Belenis to please uh, start his presentation. Uh, over to you, Professor Belenis. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much for the introduction. Just want to make one comment. The book, the book that you're using is the third edition. Uh, I'll show you at the end the fourth edition, which is in color, I think. You, so if you, if time ever comes, uh, you can get the, um, uh, to the sure. fourth edition. Thank and, you. You know, the, the, you'll see some, you'll see, I think we have somebody, a little, a little baby. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you will see the difference between the third, uh, the previous three editions and the fourth. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just trying to tell you, you will see some of the view graphs today. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Schaub. Is that correct? Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, uh, almost correctly. Yes, it's sure. Almost correct. Well, the yeah, same thing you. with you. 
you, the same thing with you, almost correctly, uh, my name is Balan. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. you know, but it's close, I, I presume. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, uh, what I'm gonna try to, let me, see, let me open the presentation here. There we are. Uh, to do then to review uh, antenna technology uh, evolution from uh, the past to present to future. I'm gonna try to highlight some of the major um, accomplishments and advances, but I apologize in advance if I uh, accidentally and, and not intentionally, I leave out uh, any significant contributions that I may not have been aware of. I will appreciate for, um, for purposes of continuity, if we can hold on to questions until the end of the presentation, where there will be time for uh, questions and answers, at least I will have time. And um, so with that, we're ready to proceed. Let me see here, all right. Now what, there we go. Okay, antennas. Well, according to John Krause and you, some of you, maybe all of you are familiar with John Krause, he's the, a um, uh, author of a book, classic book on antennas. Uh, it was an innovator and a pioneer uh, in antenna technology. He's a, a faculty member, was a faculty member at Ohio State University. And according to John Kraus, the eyes and ears, the antennas are the eyes and ears of a wireless communication system. So today's lecture then will focus on the developments of antenna technology, past, present and future. Try to outline some of the things that we, we've been, especially what we've been doing the last uh, few years. Uh, obviously time doesn't permit to do um, over all, what everybody else uh, uh, in this country as well internationally is doing. Past, if we go back memory lane, uh, outline uh, time periods of significant antenna developments from inception to the present. Back in 1968, here in the United States, there was a slogan over some cigarettes for women in particular, they used to call them Virginia Slims. They had, the slogan was, you have come a long way, baby. Well, I guess we can borrow the slogan. It says, yes, and kind of te technology has come uh, a, a long way. So we should be very proud of that, that there's a fertile ground and opportunities for uh, antenna te technology to flourish. Again, somebody's uh, interrupting here. Somebody's, uh, maybe she didn't, she didn't mute it. Uh, Okay, the beginning, I guess it traces back to uh, 1800s, middle 1800s, um, a Hertz in particular, and here's Hertz, uh, was the genesis of radio and antenna engineering. Now, Hertz in period of 1886 to 1887, put together an experiment where he had an induction coil, he energized it, uh, which was connected to the um, feet points of a dipole. In the vicinity of the, this dipole, there was also a, a rectangular loop with these dimensions. And what, um, the, the, so the, the dimensions of, of, of the loop. Okay, we have, we have another uh, uh, potential engineer, I think on the background, um, he created spark at the feet point of this dipole when he energized the induction coil, which in turn created a spark at the feet point of the nearby uh, rectangular loop. So that was the first uh, signal, transmission of signal from, a, uh, from an antenna to a, another nearby antenna. Of course, a significant contribution, we all familiar with Marconi's uh, 2000 mile transmission from Cornwall, England to Newfoundland, Canada in 1901, 
where he had a uh, antenna, as you see in here, a conical uh, type of an antenna. And here's uh, Mr. Marconi that lived in the periods of 1874, 1937. Again, this could be considered the genesis of wireless communications over long transatlantic distances. In the 1920s, 1930s, there was a major. <laughs> Uh, uh, Professor Lannis, I think uh, your mic is muted. Can you please unmute your mic? Thank you. Okay. All right. Is it now okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. What we refer to is the Yagi. A lot of people, they call it Yagi antenna, but actually, in due respect, to Yagi's colleague Uda, it should be called Yagi Uda Antenna Array. This was a classic contribution, classic antenna design. See, now we, now we, oh, now we, what's, what's, the, what's the problem here? Let's move on, here we go. Here's Yagi, uh, you can see the time period. Um, uh, he lived in his colleague, Uda. In fact, Uda was up uh, about 10 years difference between the two of them. And if you pay close attention, unfortunately, they both passed uh, away the same year. Uh, they were very close colleagues and a lot of the contributions should be attributed to, to and recognized to, to both of them. Uh, so that was the genesis of modern antenna technology, very classic design and we're still, uh, Included in books I have done in mine and also other books. And also, you know, we present it in classes and a lot of other designs which are based on this classic uh, configuration. And what is the, the, this Yagi Ure antenna? It's a, a linear array where you have one element energized, one element which is has to be slightly larger than the energized element, which we usually, refer to. it could be one or two at the very most, which we call the reflector, or reflector or reflectors. And then we have a number of elements, um, which are slightly smaller than the energized element, which we call the directors. And what this, this con kind of configuration does, it creates energy uh, and where the maximum is in the forward direction, as I'm showing here with the arrow and a typical pattern, uh, as you see. I'll give you some guidelines on the design, although they have been, even though at that time, because of lack of what we have today, software and analytical methods and uh, uh, simulations, the uh, the design may not have been optimized and there have been many studies since then where the, uh, uh, the gain, if you wish, of the antenna has been optimized by, non by using non-uniform uh, elements and non-uniform spacings. So the first paper was in 1928. Uh, this was it, the first paper in English. There were a lot of work done uh, uh, in Japan. Both of these gentlemen were in Japan and a lot of, of their contribution were written in um, journals, um, books, whatever, but written in Japanese. It was in, in 1920s when uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Yagi came and attended one of the predecessor to IEEE. It used to be called the IRE, Institute of Radio Engineers. And he presented the, he made the presentation in English and hence this particular um, publication that I'm showing you at the, at the bottom, uh, beam transmission of ultra short waves, proceedings of the IEEE. Uh, 
Uh, it was about 1963 when IEEE, they changed the name to IRE. There used to be two societies before 1963, IRE and AIE, American Institute of Electrical Engineers. They merged together and they formed IEEE. Anyway, uh, that was the first classic paper. Now, what is it used for? Well, applications, has many applications, especially for TV, uh, uh, amateur radio, frequencies, HF, VHF, UHF. And back in the old days before the cable TV, for example, in, uh, people used to use, uh, that didn't have very many channels uh, for TV. Uh, because this is kind of narrowband antenna, and I will compare that with another more broadband antenna in, in a few minutes. Uh, they use Yagi Uda antennas for TV reception. In fact, in, in my own country, uh, in Greece, where, where they, some years ago, some decades ago, they used to have two channels uh, on TV. One was vertically polarized, the other one horizontally polarized. They, they were using two Yagi antennas orthogonal to each other. Um, so yes, very popular to say the least. And here's a, at the beginning, uh, some guidelines of uh, uh, design using uniform uh, uh, lengths and spacing. The director, the directors, the, those are the smaller elements, somewhere between 0.4 and 0.45 wavelengths. The feed element had to be a resonant uh, dipole or, uh, type. Uh, with the stated dimensions, reflectors, reflector lens, and as I indicated, has to be slightly larger than the feed element and of the directors. And the, the spacings, again, we, here we show uniform spacings of the directors, and of course, the spacing between the reflector and the feed element. By the way, that spacing, uh, it seems to, after many studies, it seems like the 0.25 a wavelength spacing is kind of the optimum. Uh, so for optimized performance, direct length and spacing should be non-uniform. Here's a typical pattern uh, in the E plane and the H plane of a Yagi Uda antenna, again with the maximum uh, in the forward direction. This was a 15 elements, um, maximum directivity about a 15 dB. And those are the beam widths in the E plane and the H plane. And you can see the H plane, it's slightly larger beam width. The E plane is the colored one. The H plane is the grayscale pattern. Here's a commercial um, TV antenna. Uh, channels in, back in the older days, uh, some of you were not around at that time yet, uh, was uh, uh, at least in the United States was channel two through 13. And you can see the non-uniform, the um, non-uniform of the spacing of the TV antenna to, for the for the smaller channel, uh, channel two. The gain was about 4.4 dB, and for channel 13, about 7.3 dB. This was a company, Vanguard, was a manufacturer of TV antennas at that time. Here are some of the publications. Okay, we already stated that in 1928, that was the first paper written in English uh, uh, when Mr. Yagi uh, attended uh, the IRE convention in the, in the United States in, in, in the 1920s. Um, in 1980s, in 1984, IEEE, um, former IRE and AIE, uh, celebrates a hundred year anniversary. Now, this many of you may know this. And in the proceedings of the IEEE, which in, includes all societies of the IEEE, they decided that year to, to uh, publish some of the classic papers in each of the areas of electrical engineering. And we have, a, I don't know how many there are today, but 30 some societies, 30 some magazines, uh, transactions, whatever. So from each society, they decided to, to publish at least one paper. Well, for the Antenna Propagation Society, they only published one paper. And that was the, the paper by Yagi. And this was published in May, 1984. So that just tells you how classic this paper was. 
and the proceedings of the IEEE repeated the publication of this paper in its original form in 1997. So I think that's uh, enough to convince you that, that this paper was indeed a classic. Now, another classical antenna configuration is the helix or the helical antenna, as I'm showing here. Um, you take a wire and you wind it in the form of a helix, and then you can see on the inset over here the relationship between the spacing, the circumference, and the, and the length of one turn of the helical antenna. Now, the inventor of this one is John Krauss. I mentioned his name uh, at the beginning of the presentation, and John was a good friend of mine. Was I got to meet him um, a few times and lived um, in, in, in this time period. And again, the one of the first published papers on the helical antenna back in 1947. This particular antenna has two different modes of operation. One is what we refer to as the uh, normal or broadside mode. That's when the uh, circumference is small compared to the wavelength and maximum is in the horizontal direction. Uh, this type of uh, design was used for uh, back at the beginning of the, uh, uh, the cell phone when the antenna was external, you know, the whip antenna. Instead of being a straight wire, it was a small helix. And the reason was a helix because um, it gave you a larger um, input impedance on the order of about 15 to 20 ohms, and it was easier to match to a typical practical transmission line of let's say over 50 ohms. Well, that type of a design was used because you want to communicate mostly in the horizontal direction. It had this kind of a pattern, which we call the broadside mode. However, for space applications, uh, you want this kind of a pattern. Yeah, you want a, uh, a single, preferably, you know, like a, uh, a single uh, lobe, uh, okay? And it was a maximum, let's say, in the vertical direction, as I'm indicating here, this we call it the end fire axial mode. And this when the circumference of the helix is max optimized about one about one wavelength. Here's a commercial one. Oops, let me go back again here. This was uh, courtesy of one of the companies uh, here in the United States. All right. Another classic design of antenna. It was the log periodic logarithmic periodic is what it stands for. And this was invented at University of Illinois. This one again, another publication dates back in 1950s in the IRE convention uh, of by the Hamill and Isbell. Those were a couple of names you keep in mind that were major contributors to the log periodic antenna. What is the log periodic antenna? What's well, kind of a similar to the uh, in pr for practical purposes and for practical applications for TV antenna, but it was more broadband than the uh, the Hele uh, No, I'm sorry. Uh, when we were talking about the uh, the one from Japan, you know, the Yagi Uda. Yagi Uda was maybe could accommodate maybe a couple of channels, uh, maybe. A few channels. This was more broadband. You could accommodate the channels of two through thirteen that were kind of standard here in the United States back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, un until the cable. And still, some people still in rural areas use the log periodic antennas for TV applications. But it's not only for TV; other applications as well. So, University of Illinois was kind of the uh, where this was invented. And here's kind of the uh, geometry uh, of the, you can see now the lengths of the elements are not uh, uh, uniform. Spacing is not uniform. And the spacing at the feet point also should not be uniform, but that's not a major um, impediment, if you wish, or, or 
requirement, I think, but the requirement, the definite requirement is that the lengths of the elements change by a certain ratio and the spacing between the elements also change by the same ratio. And when it does that, it has, it has, it creates a pattern that we'll talk about in a minute that it repeats itself as a function not of the frequency, but of the log of frequency, hence the name logarithmic periodic. So this kind of um, antenna design has a, uh, a uh, pattern which the, the maximum is in the direction of the smaller elements. The larger element act as the reflectors, which they push the energy, let's say from right to left as I'm showing it show me, uh, here. Again, um, uh, here's another Isbell. Uh, was uh, uh, particular involved with this design and get a paper now you can see the IRE transactions antenna propagation 1960. So here is kind of the relationships, <clears throat> excuse me here. Uh, as to how the lengths, um, the separations, uh, the spacing between uh, the feed points, as well as the diameters of the elements, it should change by the same ratio. And this ratio is this one over tau. Now, as I indicated, the, uh, the most critical part is that uh, on this relationship, the lengths and the separations. Now, the diameters, if you have 15 elements, you cannot find 15 wires which have the same, you know, which, whose diameter, you know, changes by a certain ratio. But you can maybe, you, you can bunch them into groups. If they, let's say if they're nine elements, you can put them into groups of three, where three have the same diameter, the other three, another diameter, and the other three, another diameter. Same thing with the spacing at the feed points. But the critical parts are the lengths and the separations of the elements. I think those, uh, that relation has to be abided by in order to uh, create the characteristics, <clears throat> if we, which are log periodic, which as I show here, uh, the input impedance as a function of the logarithm of the frequency changes by this, uh, <clears throat> repeats itself, it's periodic, but it's periodic as a function of the log of frequency, not of the frequency itself, hence the name logarithmic periodic or in short, log periodic. Okay. Uh, here again, the frequencies uh, go back to the early days of the uh, channels, uh, TV channels uh, two through 13, uh, typical gain if you wish. And here is a gain versus frequency. Um, uh, uh, you can see that about seven dB compared to isotropic. Okay, very popular. Here are again the um, uh, beam widths, uh, half power beam widths in the uh, in the E plane and in the H plane, and here to compare that you can with that of the Yagi Uda. You can see that the Yagi Uda has higher uh, gain but more narrow beam width, uh, I'm sorry, more narrow bandwidth. Uh, so um, the log periodic became kind of a standard for many years, for decades, if you wish, for TV antenna. And here's a commercial one. You can see that how the lengths, how the separations between the, the elements change, creating the uh, the, the pattern, if you wish, from the larger elements toward the, well, the, the, the small elements. Another one was major contribution, especially with the space program, or, or I should say before the space program, with the uh, invention of microwave sources, sources like uh, microwave tubes, like the Klystron, which created microwave frequencies. That's one of the impediment or the, the drawback of creation of microwave antennas didn't have the sources to create uh, frequencies in the, in the microwave region. And a lot of these contributions were reported in a book, 
um, edited by Sam, Samuel Silver, who was part of the MIT Radiation Lab. Uh, during those were books were written during World War II uh, at this at this MIT Radiation Lab. That were classic papers. I think there were around 28 volumes. And I believe uh, I'm trying to think here. Uh, I think the the one about silver was volume 12 of this 28 volume published in 1947 to 1953. So that was the genesis, if you wish, of microwave antenna technology. Then, then we have for the introduction of the space program in 1960s uh, by NASA. Uh, reflectors or or some people refer to uh, refer to them as dishes exploration uh, used for exploration uh, space exploration radio astronomy communication systems and so forth actually this <clears throat> this the introduction in, of these reflectors dates back again to Hertz uh, in 1987. 1987. Uh, I think this. I think this is wrong. I think and this uh, should be 1887 to 1888. 1987. It hasn't been too long ago. No, that's correction. Uh, but it was a cylindrical type of a reflector, not a three-dimensional. Was a two-dimensional type of a reflector. And now here I have it correctly in 1887 to 1888 constructed the first parabolic cylindrical reflector antenna. And then uh, he was kind of a, uh, it was a type of a person, uh, another person was uh, Reber in here in the United States about 1937, 1938. He built a uh, three-dimensional reflector in, uh, in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois. That's just outside of uh, Chicago, Illinois. It's a radio telescope. He was kind of an amateur radio astronomer. Uh, so that was kind of the genesis of reflector antennas. Of course, the one that we all are familiar with and have seen it on TV. And I also have used it in my uh, fourth edition of my antenna book with the permission, of course. Uh, from NASA is the uh, the reflector uh, at 70 meter uh, diameter reflector at Goldstone, California, used for communication with the astronauts with uh, and uh, during the space program. Another one, the Horn antenna, very popular, um, and the different forms. The, we have the E plane, the H plane, the pyramidal, probably the most uh, practical, widely used antenna, and where you're taking a wave guy and you're flaring the side walls of the wave guy to form, let's say, what we refer to as the pyramidal horn with a typical um, distributions at the aperture. This is the E plane, and this is the H plane. Very popular, very practical, very widely used. At, in the microwave frequencies antennas. It has been used in lower frequencies, but the dimensions become very large because the aperture dimensions have to be few wavelengths, few meaning uh, two, three, four wavelengths at least. Uh, the inventor uh, that I will show you is William Barrett, 1938 uh, patent with a given patent shown here, which was filed in 46 and granted in 1949. Uh, the typical pattern, simulated pattern here of pyramidal horn, where you can, as you can see, very narrow main beam, uh, both in the E plane and the H plane uh, with uh, here, the, the kind of typical dimensions, one des design. And for this one, <clears throat> the, the directivity about, uh, 19 dB. You typically their activities with horn antennas, practical horn antennas, 15 to 30 dB uh, that you can get. And I have some guidelines also in my book, for example, 
um, that have extensive, extensive, extensive coverage of the horn antenna uh, in my book and as well as all other antenna books. Here is a commercial. This is a exponential taper. Instead of ch change the dimensions abruptly and create a discontinuity, which impacts the, the VSWR or the matching, you change the dimensions from the, uh, the rectangular to wave guy. Uh, I don't know what, why we're here. Let's see here. Uh, very gradually, as shown over here. This is a company um, uh, that I just NARDA, N A R D A, here in the United States. Now, uh, 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 this one here, about 16 dB at 10 gigahertz. Uh, another one, in order to have um, uh, as smoothly symmetric type of, or rotationally symmetric type of a pattern, go to a conical horn, uh, as indicated here. Now, to improve some of the characteristics of this conical horn, you, you create uh, ridges, which we call them grooves or corrugations in, on the inner surface of the, um, of the horn. And this, what, he, the, the, what it does, it creates rotationally symmetric type of a pattern. Now, if you look at uh, large reflector systems, uh, uh, you will see that the feet point, okay, at the feet point of, uh, or, or the feet element for reflector antenna in, in many applications, maybe in most applications, is a conical horn. Not only conical, but corrugated conical horn. So very uh, attractive element for such an application. Microstrip antenna became popular in 1970s, although, some of us didn't know that this, the invention goes back much earlier. I'll show you that in a minute. So what's microstrip antenna, or sometimes they call the patch antenna, for, which you take a substrate and you put it on its surface of the, on the top of the dielectric, uh, a patch of some geometry, most popular maybe being the rectangular, although the circular, uh, is also used in many cases. So here is the substrate, and that's the, the patch, and creates a pattern where the maximum is normal to the patch. Uh, here's the circular, again, as I indicated, also popular. Actually, the invention goes back to 1953, even though the, the um, design the, um, remained dormant for nearly uh, 20 years. Well, nearly 20 years, late 60s. Certainly in the, in the 70s, it became very popular. And if you look at the transactions or so antenna propagations, and maybe even the MTT, micro theory and techniques, you will see a lot of publications, uh, a lot of the papers published in those journals, transactions were devoted to microstrip lines, microstrip antennas. A, a, a person that popularized uh, the microstrip antenna was Bob Munson, um, uh, and which I show here. Um, Bob uh, worked for a company, antenna company, and um, the um, it made a significant contribution, if you wish, uh, instead of also. Uh, from single elements, the arrays. Uh, that's kind of the, some of the contribution. Here's one of the papers uh, that um, published by uh, Bob in the transactions, Antipoly transactions on the antenna and propagation. Okay, uh, <clears throat> here are some dimensions, uh, design of a rectangular microstrip and this is circular microstrip with the E plane and the H plane in the respective to the, these two respective designs. Here are again simulated patterns, actually not only simulated but also measurements that we here in my laboratory uh, that we design 
uh, simulated and also measured, me measured if you wish, uh, and also included in the um, in the fourth edition, I think this is of the antenna book. Uh, you can see uh, when I mentioned uh, color, um, the three-dimensional pattern, the uh, um, S11, the matching of the element to a transmission line again, and then of course the E plane and the H plane patterns. Uh, this is a circular uh, patch, similarly with these dimensions. Again, I think this you'll find it in the, in the antenna book. Again, with the all three pattern, all three, uh, all four characteristics: uh, three-dimensional pattern, um, S11, E plane, and H plane patterns. Here is an array of microsoft. It was a ten by ten array uh, for communication systems. Uh, Ball Aerospace, uh, that's a company that Bob Munson uh, worked for. They're the ones that um, popularized the microchip antenna and also advanced it from single elements to arrays and they built commercial uh, designs, commercial systems. Uh, and they were the frontiers, I think, that uh, in the 70s and the advancement of the uh, microstip and microstip arrays. Now, um, multiband antennas. How can you use, you know, the, with the evolution and the advancement of the cell phone, where uh, where we the cell phone has advanced to the point where in laptops. Uh, be able to create to provide a lot of services like in social media, search engines, uh, messaging, uh, GPS, uh, emails, others. Uh, and we want for each one of them, we could, they could not afford to build separate antenna elements because they, that we wanted the cell phone, for example, to be uh, as small as possible, to look nice, to be. Uh, uh, Contoured, uh, contoured well and so forth. So is there a way you can use one basic structure, physical structure and design in such a way that can create uh, different frequencies to accommodate different uh, services? Well, here's a, let me go back to the beginning. If you take a patch antenna, this will be provide you with a single resonant frequency, for example, for a given application. Now, if you put a U, cut a U slot over there, uh, you can introduce second frequency. And then if you put another one within it, like that, you can have triple. So here we are using the same physical structure, but be able to create three different frequencies, triple band, now, you have to be careful, of course, how this is designed because you don't want the, uh, the different um, slots, if you wish, to interfere with one with the other one, okay? So we're not gonna go through details. We actually simulated such a design and here is uh, the current density on the, on the patch element uh, when we have a single, a single design, single frequency. Then, this was five gigahertz. Then we inserted a, a slot in, in the form of a U as I'm showing here and we plot the current density. You can see the current density is the strongest on the slot, not on the edges of the patch. Then this was at 5.5 gigahertz. And then you can put another one and you can see now there is, you know, the, this was not optimized. I just wanted to illustrate that for purposes of illustration. Uh, you can see how the third frequency may be a little closer to the one of the second frequency, but this was at, at 6.2 gigahertz. So the same structure, physical structure, but accommodating three different frequencies. 
for here is a commercial one. This was provided to me by a former student of mine. Okay, are we done? Uh, uh, this was um, in Korea. Uh, this was, you can see a slot over there, which is kind of purple, and to accommodate GSM, global uh, frequencies 874 to 954. You can see the DSWR and so forth. And then create, put another slot, which, which was for applications in, uh, in the DCS, okay, uh, communication system with the frequency stated here and DSWR, the bandwidth and so forth. So the, you have to be creative, if you wish, how this is designed. Now, so what's happening today? That's kind of a little bit the past. Now I have not covered everything. Has been things are going on continuously. A plethora of information published in transactions and books and handbooks and uh, presented at conferences. So I just want to, to highlight some of them, especially some of them that also I'm most familiar with. But today there's a lot of activities uh, going on. Uh, so plethora of activities. And there's an intense interest in activity, integration of EM devices such as antennas and interaction of EM waves with some uh, unique uh, surfaces, which we call meta surfaces. I'll talk about that a little bit. A lot of people work in this area in the, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, around the world, and uh, has started about 20 years ago and has accelerated uh, the last uh, few years and, and continue on and will continue. Well, meta surfaces um, has kind of is the generic name, but there are, there are the many names that people use to to identify them, uh, some people they call them artificial impedance surfaces, some people they call them artificial magnetic conductors, high impedance surfaces, uh, electronic band gap and so forth and so on. Uh, we can spend time uh, talking about each one of them. They all basically represent the same uh, type of material. Those are surfaces which do not exist in nature, materials which don't exist in nature, but you can synthesize them to have characteristics of materials, okay, which do not exist in nature, and they are very attract. They have a very attractive characteristics. I'll show you some uh, applications, some things that we have done. And again, I don't want to um, give the impression we were the only ones. There's so much activity going on, and continue on. It will continue. So meta surface, a special type of artificial synthetic surfaces, which exhibit unique and intriguing characteristics. When meta surfaces are integrated with the EM devices, antennas, for example, since we uh, interact with the EM waves, they can enhance the performance of EM devices and be able to discipline and control the scattering of the EM waves. Since the inception 1990s, as I indicated, they've been around uh, uh, starting about 1990, this topic has created intense interest and excitement into the EM community and continues today. Let me just show you a very simple example of what kind of surfaces we're talking about and why. And if we uh, judge this uh, configuration in terms of uh, efficiency and being low profile, Okay. Now, because for some space application, when you want to mount this on a spacecraft, aircraft, you want this not to create aerodynamic disturbance, if you wish. Even, uh, even nowadays with uh, high performance cars, uh, for example, would want something to stick out and create uh, aerodynamic issues. So if we take a a perfect electric conductor metal, for example, metallic surface, and we put in uh, the electric element as an, um, in the vertical direction, as I'm showing here, uh, the introduction of the surface 
in order to analyze it, to, to take into account the reflections, we introduce an image as I'm shown here dashed. Okay. Well, that has a high efficiency because the you can the direct radiation and that the reflections, you know, the add. However, it's not is not a low profile because the element sticks out. Okay, for aerodynamic purpose purposes, not low profile. Now suppose we take a horizontal electric element as shown over here. Well, to account for the presence of the reflector, PC reflector in this case, uh, the image has to be in the opposite direction. So we, so efficiency because the direct radiation is canceled by the, especially the height is zero, is canceled by the, uh, uh, by the image. So low efficiency, even if the height is small, still the efficiency is not very high but it is low profile. So it does, either one of the two does not meet the efficiency and low profile requirements. Now, suppose we had a surface PMC, perfect magnetic conductor, which is exactly the opposite, where the reflection coefficient is, let's say plus, plus one instead of minus one, traditionally for a PEC surface. Well, this kind of a surface, uh, here's the element, if we use the horizontal electric element, the image is in the same direction. So we get constructive interference between the direct radiation and that from the image. So we have a high efficiency and low profile. What's the problem? PMC do not exist, PMC surfaces do, do not exist in nature. So we have to, what? we were fortunate enough that some of the earlier, um, researchers uh, uh, were able to uh, synthesize such surfaces which have similar characteristics. Here's one, suppose you take a substrate as I'm indicating here, and we have a, a PC conductor on the bottom and then, and then we have a dielectric uh, material on top of it. And then we put patches on top of the dielectric material. Now those patches can be connected to the ground plane, not necessary, depends on the application um, with, uh, with vias, it would refer to them, <clears throat> excuse me, vias, metallic patches. And those are the so-called vias, posts, connect the patches to the ground plane. And what those patches usually do, they, because when we have such configuration, we create surface waves inside the dielectric and the introduction of the vias or the posts uh, kind of suppress uh, the propagation of surface waves or um, of the surface waves within the dielectric. Okay. Uh, one of the early papers, and this was part of a dissertation by Dan Sevenpiper at uh, UCLA uh, in 1999. And if we look at the S11, versus frequency of this surface. If you look at normal angle now, just at normal angle, and we see HFSS simulations and there's some design equations, compare the two of them. What um, this characteristic, the uh, phase of the reflection coefficient versus frequency changes in this manner from a plus 180 degrees to minus 100. And the useful, part of this frequency range is where the uh, phase angle varies between plus 90 degrees and minus 90 degrees. Now they had the, don't have to be exactly that, but in that, part, uh, in that particular region, plus or minus, this one was designed for 10.35 and lower uh, and, uh, and the higher end 14.25. And you can see right at the center of the phase of the reflection curve is zero. It's a perfect PMC. So between about 10 gigahertz to about 14 gigahertz, it acts as a PMC, but it exactly, let's say 12 gigahertz is an ideal PMC. This is the, uh, the desired characteristic of this type of a surface. They call a band gap because it, is, it exhibits this characteristics only in a frequency range. In this case, 
10 to it. So it's kind of narrow band. Typically, the bandwidth, it might be uh, 10%, uh, 10 plus or minus, uh, maybe 15% is it's quite good. Now you can do some things that you can increase uh, without doing anything, you know what I mean? Just using the generic design, maybe uh, typically about 15% uh, maximum, but I think they've been uh, designs which extended the bandwidth in uh, 80s and 90s, if you wish, and maybe show you some of that. Here is actually one where we took, took a um, horizontal uh, dipole uh, shown here, put it on top of, of such a surface. You can see the, the height above this metallic patches is very small, 200 of a wavelength at a frequency of 12 gigahertz. Uh, this is the height of the substrate. And this was a paper uh, by Yang and Ramazami in uh, October 2003. Now, if we plot the S11 versus frequency for this one, those are the um, characteristic, the frequency, the dipole length, the heights, and so forth. And the, the interesting part of it is what happens in this region here. You can see if we look at the, if we had used a PEC surface, you can see that the reflection coefficient at around maybe 30, 12 or near 13 gigahertz, uh, there has a little uh, low point, which is about maybe 3 dB, I think 3.5 in this case in particular. Uh, if it was a perfect PMC, it was about may maybe seven and a half, which is maybe acceptable. But if it's an EPG, electronic band gap, or one of this, uh, you can see it down to a 27 dB, perfect, almost perfect match. So you can see how it, the uh, attractive characteristics of such a surface, if you wish. Applications and numerous antennas, uh, RCS, a red dark cross section. Uh, applications. So I'll show you some now. I'm going to get some of the applications, the things that we have done here with, uh, I have done with my group, with low profile antennas. Here's one where we take a, a circular loop and put it on the top of a uh, design of a high impedance surface type, a metal surface. We, where the height of the element, it's only one hundredth of a wavelength up above uh, the surface of the high impedance surface. It cannot be exactly on it because the, this metallic, those patches are metallic and the, and the radiating element is metallic. So we'll put it right on the surface, it will short out. So uh, even though you can see it faintly, there's a little plastic um, material, the very thin plastic that we put between the element and the high impedance surface. Uh, that's the element there. And here's one of the papers that we published. Uh, we advanced the design. We used uh, a hybrid type of a design where the inner part is kind of designed again with the same type of an element circular loop. Uh, we also use, by the way, spiral. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to show you anything on the spiral, but show you just the, of the loop. Uh, and the inner part is kind of more um, to do a similar thing like the previous one to um, enhance the radiation characteristic. But then we use the outside, uh, the outside color, if you wish, the circular path, the circular strip to enhance the characteristics of the design. And so this is the inner part, high impedance surface. And then the outside, this. Um, brown, uh, yellow, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's a PC. There's this thing. And what we show here, if we look at the broadside realized gain, the realized gain takes into account the matching, take account into losses of the, on the element itself. Uh, so you can see the blue one is when we have the element on the top of a substrate, no high impedance surface. <clears throat> with a maximum broadside realized gain of about 2.4 dB. Then we put in this high impedance surface at the inner part uh, of the ground plane, which is the red one. Now we jumped up to 8.8 .8 dB. That was the major advantage, major addition uh, 
advancement in the game. And then we put in this outside uh, strip, if you wish, a PC strip. And, and with that, we got an additional, maybe uh, almost one and a half or 1.7 dB increase in the, in the uh, broadside realized gain. So I kind of break down, you know, what each one of them uh, does. Uh, so the maximum realized gaining will get up to about 10.5 dB. Here, well then obviously this was based on simulations, but we actually build one. Uh, again, with that frequency measurements and here maximum gain of 10.5 dB. It's shown here, both measurements in our facility that we have and also the simulations that we performed and paper that we published uh, in the uh, AWL letters uh, in 2008. RCS reduction, uh, very another application. So if you, if you take a, a plate, PC plate, and you got incoming wave, you know, the, the scattered field is a, along the specular direction, specular direction, the maximum is in that direction. It's what the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of the incident, specular direction, okay? So if we take, for, for example, PEC plate and uh, illuminate it with an incident wave and normal incidence uh, or any angle, but we could get shadow wave, but the maximum, the maximum will be in, in the same direction as the incoming wave, as I'm showing here. Coming this way, the maximum, of course, we get scattering in other directions as well. Now, if you make the, the plate infinite, then you, you just have, a, a, you know, the, you don't have radiation or scattering in other directions, just in only one direction, but that's an ideal one, infinite, infinite ground plane. All right, so we've had, what can we do to reduce this uh, scattering? Well, we introduced, uh, checkerboard design. We, we take a ground plane, uh, a substrate, and we put uh, designs of these patches, different uh, configurations, different designs. Here we have two different patches, uh, some of them square as well as circular. That's just one design. We call those EPG1, the, the square, the other on the circular. And uh, again, a paper that we back in 2015. And what, what does this do? Well, here's one that we actually fabricated and tested, of course. Um, you can see the square and you can see the circular. By the way, again, we have other ones, uh, more advanced ones and increase the bandwidth. Uh, if we look at the scattering, if we illuminate the surface at normal incident, like we did before the PEC, the pattern that we the scattering pattern that we create is what's shown here. We're creating four lobes away from the direction of incidence. So what are we doing? We, oh, no. we, 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 we redirecting the energy away from the uh, direction it was coming from. This particular one was maximum occur at a plane of 45 degrees at an angle of nearly 50 from the uh, from the normal uh, direction, another one 135, and it repeats itself every 90 degrees. Now, you're gonna say, what, 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 what happened? How was this happening? We'll show you that in a minute, give you a little more physical intuition into the process. Actually, what those patches, when you illuminate with this wave, and I'm showing here the current density on the patches, we're creating an array of elements. This we, in, in this particular case, we have a four by four antenna array. You can see the, using the coloring, okay, the current density uh, created on those patches, both the rectangular, I'm, I'm sorry, the square in this particular case, and uh, uh, the circular one. See, we have an array of uh, elements and so to show you that, yeah, we have a four by four antenna element with some separation and with a 
there's a phase difference between the square and the circular patches. That's a, a represented by beta x, the phase difference between the patches in the x direction and beta y, the phase difference. In. So based upon that then, you see, and here are the specific details concerning with the phase as well as the separation between the elements and, and so forth. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And now we, we, we used another surface, which was hexagonal in shape as I'm showing there on the inset. And here we're creating six beams instead of, uh, oops, go back over here, every um, 60 degrees away from each other. Okay, this was the, the hexagonal. By the way, this was done at 7.5 gigahertz. By the way, again, we had simulations and measurements. So based on our ray theory, if you go back again, it, uh, those of you that might be familiar with my book in chapter six, where I talk about rays, a rectangular arrays over here. So what are we doing is we have elements in the X direction, elements in the Y direction. We have phase difference with uh, space separation in the X direction, D sub X with space separation in the Y direction, D sub Y with phase differences in the X direction between the elements, phase difference of the elements in the Y direction. And we can create a beam. We can tilt the beam in some direction. So that's what we have basically what's happening uh, to be able to uh, to provide some physical intuition in, into the process of the scattering. Uh, all right, so here are the equations, you know, how to find wh where is the maximum. If you know the separation between the elements, you know the phase difference between the elements, you, you can find the angles where the maximum uh, have been uh, directed towards. All right. Future, well, what some of the things, now again, this is not all inclusive. Okay? And I don't want to uh, leave anybody out. Uh, I apologize for not, you know, so much going on all over the world and uh, all the countries, including your own country in Pakistan and uh, um, in Asia, uh, in Europe, in the United States, Canada, Australia, you name it, all the continents. Integration, no matter what, with devices, we show some. Small antennas, antennas for 5G wireless communication, conformal, low profile designs, flexible antennas, reconfigurable, uh, ultra wideband, multiband, wearable antennas, antennas for biomedical applications, reflector rays, terahertz, others. By the way, I don't want to give the impression we're doing the, I'm doing, or my group is doing this. I'm just wanting to provide some list of what people around the world are doing. And this is, again, not all inclusive by any means. Integration materials, natural and synthetic. What are we doing? We'd be able to control, to discipline, to tame, to harness, manipulate the EM waves design devices with desired and functional characteristics and superior performance. This material usually, again, I'll show you in the beginning, people use different names. Artificial impedance surfaces, uh, artificial magnetic conductors, electronic band gap, high impedance surfaces, metal surfaces is the, the most inclusive you know, name. So conclusion, today, and kind of technology is science, is not an art. Back in the older days, people used to put them together, and, uh, change, th made changes, uh, physical changes in, in, in the system and try to improve the performance. Nowadays, it's a science. We have um, both uh, analytical methods. We have uh, uh, <clears throat> software that have been created based on and the mathematical uh, fundamentals uh, that we can do simulations and improve the performance of such systems. So it's very bright future and many challenges ahead for, especially for some of many of you young people, uh, but it's a better, we just need to exercise creativity, imagination and science. Here is that, that, that is the, 
again, I'm not trying to sell you the books over here, but in, I saw that you had this book, which is the third edition. The, the, the fourth edition was the first one. And this is the EM book that I have, Advanced Engineering Electromagnetic. I have a, a book also on introduction to smart antennas, a very small book, and then editor of a handbook on modern antenna tech. Now, this is the facility that I was showing you that we have performed a lot of the measurements. Uh, it's one of the largest, at least in the United States. Uh, compact, we have a compact range. Uh, the dimensions, uh, the inside dimensions lengthwise about 50 feet, um, 15, 15 meters, I guess, since you guys use meters mostly, like, uh, I think about 26 feet, uh, 12 or whatever, uh, uh, 11 meters, whatever, uh, we did the conversion and about 18 feet in height. And we have a generic a helicopter inside that we have, because I had a group of a consortium of, of companies, uh, industrial companies and government agencies for 28 years here. They were sponsoring my research. And uh, one of the main objectives was uh, structures, uh, airframes, uh, that of a helicopter, as well as others, but helicopter was the, uh, the focus, I think, during that time. So I uh, thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to try to, I did say try, I don't have all the answers by any means, based on my experience uh, to answer any of these questions. So thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Belenis. I think it's a very, very interesting talk covering the past, present and future. And as you mentioned, the future is bright and many challenges are uh, about to come and are already going on. So it will be very interesting to work in this area uh, and especially reading your books and uh, learning from you and your experience. Now I request uh, the other moderator, Dr. Hamad Chima, to please proceed ahead with the uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noshawan. Thank you, Dr. Balanis, uh, for the um, you know insights you provided and also the historical perspective. It's very uh, good to acknowledge the people who were really pioneers uh, in this area. So uh, the first question I had was, uh, there is a category of antennas called the on-chip antennas, uh, where there is a, a trend to integrate the antenna on the silicon chip. So the circuits are made on a silicon chip, uh, CMOS technologies, uh, you might heard of that. So the question from a participant is that, what kind of antennas are suitable uh, for this category, the on-chip antennas? which have uh, the silicon substrate has a lossy uh, you know, behavior typically with a high ER. Again, I, I'm not uh, active in this particular area. I have heard of it. Um, uh, again, I don't, again, I'm taking a guess over here. I'm, I'm, uh, my answer may not be correct in any way. Um, I don't know, my, again, based on its popularity and its attractive characteristics, um, compact, I guess, um, environment, uh, small environment, um, maybe micro strip type of patches type of antennas. I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure. So I'm, I think you have, you're going to have to search the literature to see what other people are doing. So I'm not, I'm not giving you a very good answer, I think, uh, on that one. Okay, no, no problem. Dr. Noshivan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, so, Professor Bananas, we have a very limited time. So, uh, maybe a, a couple of questions regarding the RF and microwave area. So, as you know, these days, uh, many other areas like machine learning, artificial intelligence is uh, there. Uh, so, how you, in, as per your experience, this RF and microwave area uh, has uh, some uh, relationship with artificial intelligence or machine learning? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I haven't gotten involved. I have seen that, and it's, it seems like they, there's a lot of interest in that. I keep in the conferences, I see sessions form based on that. So I think there seems to be, again, based on what I have observed without being involved, uh, using a lot of people used to make fun of the artificial intelligence. Okay, I had a colleague here in mechanical engineering, when you would talk about uh, intelligent systems. He said the only the only people that the only thing you uh, uh, only ones that have intelligence are humans, okay? 
<laughs> you know, yeah, obviously creativity in terms of software designs and, you know, how you approach it. So it seems like this artificial intelligence and you see that even um, at the level of uh, uh, major industrial companies and uh, government, they now you see talking about artificial intelligence. So obviously there's something there, okay? How much? Yeah. I don't know because I'm not a professional. I'm not an expert, but, but anyway. Other more, I'm, I'm more for the, an observer, if you wish. Yeah, that's very true. And as you mentioned, many conferences now have some sessions, even many uh, journals have some sessions that discuss basically the relationship between the RF microwave area and the, these uh, growing areas of uh, AI and machine learning. So, Professor, uh, uh, I have a, just a yeah, third, I have a colleague here uh, in ASU. He, his wife is in electrical engineering. His wife, he is. Uh, in computer science, okay? Um, I'm, I'm gonna make a little bit of a joke of this. Uh, and he's considered to be a, a leading expert in artificial intelligence. And, and I, make, I make fun of him. I've been making fun of him over years about this artificial intelligence. I said, it's a stupidity. I tell him just to, to, to get on his skin. <laughs> but it looks like, <laughs> but it looks like he's coming out ahead of me. You know, he's proven to be more right uh, as to what, from what I see. So I have to tone my voice down a little bit on him to be a little more nice. Yeah, that's true. So professor, as a, from your experience, um, I need uh, maybe your advice or suggestion for the students of uh, Pakistani students, how they join this area. And even though you, you gave an interesting talk on the history of this area. So what is your, um, maybe a summarized suggestion to the uh, Pakistani students uh, who would like to join this area? Well, mm, we have students here from, uh, I haven't seen as, as many, at least at our institution from Pakistan, but I have seen, I guess, uh, students from other countries. Um, um, uh, most of them, I think the foreign students, uh, uh, excluding this past year because of the COVID and so forth, uh, have come from uh, two places. I think uh, India and um, um, China, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. especially from India, I think. And I had a couple of them in, in my group, but by the way, I'm on towards the twilight zone of my career. In fact, as you've seen, I have already, uh, as of June the 11th, I have retired after 50 and a half years in teaching and uh, six and a half, uh, six years working for NASA. I worked for six years for NASA and then 50 and a half years teaching. Uh, so I'm not taking any new students, but I had students, foreign students here. Uh, and this is some of the things that we've been, have been doing uh, and I presented here some of that have been students from other countries, you know, some from, I have students from Iran, I have students for a couple of students from, two, three students from uh, India uh, and, um, so, uh, students from some other countries. Uh, so what they have to do is, you know, I'm sure a lot of things are going on to your country. Uh, uh, it's a demand, you know, electromagnetics is usually considered a difficult area. You know? Yeah, 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 that's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's hard for us to, you know, so, so they have to, those of that really want to do something creative uh, based on some real fundamentals instead of, uh, uh, again, to go to artificial intelligence, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, yes, talk, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it's, 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 more, it's more difficult, but it's, but it's more rewarding at the end of it. You can see, I think, if you base it on what happens to the students after they graduate, I know based on, the, on mine and some other ones that I know have been on the committees, uh, they grab them immediately. Companies here, they, you know, get jobs in the United States with an with a outstanding salary. Well, wow. okay. I, I know for me, you know, uh, for, for my own case, you know, with, with my own students, I should say, yeah. uh, they, they, they're not, they, they did not have a difficult time getting a job. Mm. Okay. So, yes, they, maybe they had to work hard, but the end result, it was rewarding. Yeah. So I think the same thing with the students from Pakistan, you know, whether they stay in your country, and I hope, you, you know, you can keep the good ones or whatever, but there are opportunities in other countries, not just in the United States. Many of them will go to, you know, the, uh, uh, Europe, if you wish, um, 
uh, I don't know how many of your students go to uh, other countries in Asia, but like in um, Korea, maybe um, uh, China and, and, and so forth. Uh, but there are certainly opportunities in the, in the United States from what I have seen. Yes, I'm, I'm sure after your uh, this talk, many students, many Pakistani students, especially will, I, will email you as well to contact you. So uh, maybe you will see many in your industry as well. As well. So uh, we have very, uh, we, we are on short of time. So we have very uh, quick two questions. Uh, there are two participants. So I request Mr. Uh, Rambli uh, to please proceed ahead with the question. Mr. Ramli, if you can, can you please unmute your mic and ask the question? Otherwise, I proceed to the next uh, participant, Hussain Ali Bukhari. Well, thank you, Dr. Nashurvan. Uh, hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, yes. Hello, uh, Professor Balanis. Yes, Ramli, please, please go ahead. All right. Since one of the future technology that you mentioned is about, I mean, you stated there is a. I think he's on, uh, on and off. Right? Uh, terahertz communication, which the frequency is very, very high. What do you think about the support system that we have, that we have currently? Um, what do we, I'm sorry. Yeah, turn uh, I think I, we, we, we are unable to get the question due to the, I think and there's a, a problem. The most sense. important thing, if we come up with the many simulations because we cannot measure, so what do you think in order to publish in a very good journal? Thank you. I didn't catch a question totally. It was, it was in and out, in and out. So, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, so uh, okay, no problem. Um, uh, Mr. Ramdi, you can uh, send your question in chat or you can send an email to Professor Blenis uh, to ask this question maybe uh, later. So, one last question for. Hello, can you hear me again? Hassan Bukhari, Hassan Bukhari, you may proceed, proceed ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Balenis, for the wonderful presentation. And it's an honor to be asking you this question. So my, uh, my question is that, uh, as you mentioned, that the antenna design has become more of a science uh, rather than an art. But the general practice, uh, usually the antenna designers uh, follow, is that they uh, rely too much on simulations. And then after they have achieved something in simulations, they try to fit something uh, uh, fit an analytical explanation or uh, to it afterwards. So, is this a, a good practice in your uh, opinion? Okay, you you actually uh, asked the right the, the, the right questions, uh, and it happens not in industry, but it happens even uh, in our groups. Okay, as soon as you give a student an assignment, okay, to do something. The first thing that the student does is what you said exactly. It would go and get a software and try to uh, analyze it. And sometimes they get the answers because you know software and uh, you know you don't put the data correctly. You can get anything you want to. Okay. Yes, definitely. So, the, so they jump in into the simulations. I think the correct way, the more correct way is, and I think the and I have another presentation. Uh, which is more educational, uh, which I make. And I, I clearly state, okay, that the, before you jump into the simulations, first of all, you should, you should do some analytical um, examination, formulation, or look at the problem, what is the problem? What, and also if you can maybe in advance have some indication what to expect before you jump in. Yes, you can start simultaneously simulations to help you along because simulations, as we showed just a while ago, in our case, with the scattering, you know, when you illuminate this um, uh, meta surface, uh, the checkerboard surface, what are you doing? You're creating uh, a, uh, uh, an antenna array, which is hard to see from the analytical formulations. You can do that maybe simultaneously, but not to, depend on that initially. I think this is an excellent tool to have 
a good simulation tool. But in, a, but in advance, you should try to do some uh, analytical uh, examination, formulation, uh, to, to look at the problem before you jump into the, to the, to the software. Yes, so in some ways, we're doing harm instead of doing good, but allowing them to jump into the, into the simulations. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm kind of on your side, I think the, the saying, and, and I do have that as a statement in, in one of my other presentations, to be careful when you use simulations, they can give you anything you want. I had a, actually a research engineer with me for 30 years and I gave him, uh, I think we wanted to simulate something an antenna on a helicopter, which I showed you. And he used one of the softwares, I don't want to measure that, but he didn't use it properly. He came in with a given pattern. And I said, no, I say, I said, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look right, something is wrong. So he went back and looked at how he, he inputted the, the data and he inputted data incorrectly. So after he did, he did a little more, took, uh, uh, time, took a little more time in looking at it, looked at what he did, came up with the correct results. So with the simulation, you can get anything you want to, if you do it improperly. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, that uh, pretty much sums it well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, just one, two questions more. Uh, Mr. Niraj, uh, can you please proceed ahead with your question? Um, uh, thanks for, uh, for our organizing this thing. And thanks, uh, um, Professor Balanis and Dr. Shoaib. My question is that how, um, how do we evaluate uh, feed um, when we have a GC, uh, CG uh, means grounded uh, CPW to microstrip transition uh, between the two um, uh, two ground planes, kind of like a sandwich. It's like a it's if I say it's not a it's kind of a strip line, but the strip line the feed is like a G, um, CPW to microstrip transition. So we have all three combined in a same structural kind of multi-layer. So uh, could you please give some um, your of advice how to ev evaluate that kind of uh, feed structure? Well, in again, in, in the CBW, uh, I think you from, again, I have not been in, excuse me, involved with that, but just from my own general knowledge, it's very critical there that you have uh, in CPW, you know, how you put the, the feed point. I think you can adjust the dimensions of uh, there near the feed point in order to be able to get the right match, uh, especially in multi-layer. Yes. Okay? Yep. But uh, what if the uh, CPW is embedded between two ground planes? Then how can we treat that thing? It, it's kind of well, a... I, I, that, that I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, it's okay. Uh, okay. It's okay. Thank, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, Dubs. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much all for joining us. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, quite late at some areas. So I apologize. We uh, won't be able to uh, have more questions. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask to Professor Belenis via email. Uh, that is available at your chat. So in that, I would like to thank you, Professor Belenis is indeed a player for our chapter to host you. Uh, indeed, a very interesting talk um, that gives an overview of the uh, antenna history and its future trends. And it's really encouraging uh, for our students as well to join this area. And uh, some of our students are already working in this area. They also um, and learn uh, many uh, aspects of the antenna from your uh, presentation. And indeed, your books are, are being followed in Pakistan in both undergrad and graduate level. And uh, thank you very much for making such amazing books and making the life of our, for, for professors very easy to um, teach the course in a very efficient way. So thank you very much, Professor Belenis, and uh, thanks all for joining us. And uh, now I'm about to conclude the session. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Concluding remarks, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope uh, the presentation was valuable. I don't know how many 
I guess you, I don't know what kind of turnout that, that you had and from what you from what you were expecting. Uh, are these participants primarily from Pakistan or from your own university, or own region? Or, where are they yeah. coming from? Most of them. Yeah. Um, I, in 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 your uh, webinar, which is 29th webinar, we have the highest number of participants and more than 150 participants have joined so far. They're not just from Pakistan, uh, 150, 150, yeah, okay. they, they join on. And uh, they're uh, participants from Pakistan, India, and maybe China and other countries as the UK. So the mixed uh, participants and uh, from universities and uh, from uh, uh, professors and students. So it, it was a, a, a mixed uh, participants from uh, several parts of the world. Uh, to attend. So it was higher than you were expecting or? or, or um... it is, it, as I mentioned, it is the highest number of participants that we have achieved so far. It's, it's oh, much, okay. much higher than I expected. I was expecting up to 50 participants, but it's, it's more than 150. So it's really, really, really good to see uh, many people that were joining us and uh, um, attending your talk. It's really, okay. really uh, well, I appreciate that. That's encouraging. Just, just send me the money. Just send me the money for the extra ones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, <laughs> Professor Benes, uh, we are also conducting a conference next year in Pakistan, or so this year in Pakistan by the end of the year. So, we we also wish we also wish that you visit Pakistan in person as well, and hope this pandemic situation will get better with time, and hope to see you in Pakistan very soon. Okay, appreciate. It. Yeah, I have visited. I've, I've been to. I've been to some of the Asian countries, including India. Of course, the you know the environment nowadays is not conducive, you know, for for travel even within the United States, much less internationally. So hopefully, the things will improve and we'll get back to so-called "quote unquote" normal or some kind of normalcy. So we'll be able to, you know, to travel to some other places and maybe hopefully one day maybe we even be able yeah. to come to Pakistan. Appreciate sure. it. And, and um, it was a, my pleasure to, to do it. And I hope it met your expectations and uh, both in terms of attendance as also the accommodation in terms of time, you know, because we do have a 12 hour difference. I had yeah. one last night, but it was local, you know, the ham radio, amateur radio, uh, which started the meet at seven o'clock in the evening. So I had to do that late in the evening and of course today uh, do yours and I have some couple of other ones online uh, expecting oh. to. So very busy okay. you for you, yeah, yeah. Okay. So well, thank you very uh, much and uh, regards to everybody and uh, hopefully uh, things will improve and maybe we'll see some of you in person in some of the conferences and. Uh, yeah, thank you very much and have a nice day. Yeah, thank, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, thank you, bye. -bye. bye. bye.